Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Scarlett Fu. Stocks sink and Treasuries rally on a jobs report that one Fed official says requires action, perhaps even a big cut. So here's the market fallout from the weaker than expected jobs report. Let's start with the S&P 500 here. Down for a fourth day and on course for its worst week since March of 2023. And this is a broad-based sell-off. You're seeing it across sectors, but big tech is definitely leading losses. The Magnificent 7 losing 3.4% with all seven members lower. Treasury have rallied every day this week. Today's no exception. Uh, the yield on the short end, which is of course ultra sensitive to Fed policy, or at least what the Fed might do, falling as much as 15 basis points. It's paired some of that back now down six basis points. The 10-year yield uh, also down about one basis point right now. Worth noting that the 2's 10 spread curve is now positive. We'll see if it stays that way through the afternoon. So let's get back to the equities side for a moment here and bring in Abigail Doolittle, who's been looking at the big movers. Yeah, well, let's take a look at the chip space because we do have this decline for the S&P 500. But on the week, we're down about 4%, the worst week going back to March of uh, 2023. The Nasdaq 100 down more than that on the week, the worst week since September of 2022. It has everything to do with the sell-off and big tech, but chips in particular. NVIDIA is the biggest drag on both of these indexes, down about 5% on the day, down nearly 30% from its recent peak, so very much in a bear market. This is the stock went too far too fast. The recent quarter guide, not quite a much quite enough. Broadcom, same deal. Not up as much as uh, NVIDIA into its quarter, but the guide is light, and you can see that these re uh, the results in particular of Broadcom last night or today, uh, really taking down super microcomputer. And Intel's plan uh, to divest some portion of Mobileye, well, not helping out their shares. But it's not just technology. All 11 sectors in the S&P 500 are red, and beneath, behind the big tech, tech sectors, beyond chips, Apple, Tesla, Google, we have the banks that are down uh, the most Wells Fargo down the better part of 5%. You can see Bank of America weak, JP Morgan, Citigroup. All of these money center banks are weak as yields go in. That actually hits their lending business. So we're in one of these areas where there's really nowhere to hide. When we connect this with the S&P 500 overall, Scarlett, and we take a look at what's happening beneath the hood, or I guess on top of the hood here, we're going to see this really nice uptrend out of last year's lows. But we've been in this period of congestion. From a really wonky standpoint, this is called a double top. It's a perfect one because this one is lower. It tells you those buyers were less enthusiastic than those buyers. The neckline's around 5,200. The target closer to 4,600. It looks like a great pattern. And so long as that yen, that haven yen, uh, Scarlet continues to strengthen, that scoots or moves investors out of risk assets. And that's a big piece of why we have this selling action today. Yeah, great reminder to keep an eye on the other asset classes, including the Japanese yen. Abigail, thank you so much. Let's go back to the jobs report because the latest numbers are fueling debate over the Fed rate cuts later this month and again for the months to come as well. Take a listen. This report is better than in July. We think the economy is definitely slowing. It's a little bit weaker on margin. This economy is not slowing down in the way that markets are anticipating. When we think about September, um, you know, we think 25 basis points is, is quite reasonable. It's hard to say, you know, which way they go. I think, the, you know, the market is pushing for 50. 25 is the right number, given that literally everything in this report was better than in July. I don't think this report is definitive uh, on the 25 versus 50. Is monetary policy really so restrictive? It doesn't look like it's restrictive. If it was really restrictive, the employment report would be a lot weaker. The Fed, they need to get, they need to adjust policy back to more normal levels. And the question is just how quick do they want to do that? Just a sampling of the voices we've hosted on Bloomberg about the jobs report. For more on that data, let's bring in Tom Porcelli. He is chief U.S. economist at PGM Fixed Income. Tom, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. I think about the reactions that we got from our guests. I also think about what Chris Waller, the Fed governor, said. Uh, and he said that if no longer requires patience, it requires action. The question is, is it action in the form of 50 basis points or is it uh, action in the form of 50 basis points this month and more in the coming months. Yeah, so Scarlett, always good to be with you. Uh, uh, look, I, I think that you're, you're, the, fee, the Fed is teeing up 25 for, for September. I, I don't think that this, this report doesn't scream go 50. I, I, I think that they should go 50, um, but, uh, but, but they're not. And I mostly think they should go 50 because I think they should have already been cutting rates. Um, but, but this is not the report that, that's going to bring them to that. I, I think that this is a, a, a 25 basis point kind of report. But um, look, I, and I, I love the sort of the, the lead in with with all of the commentary from um, from the other economists. Uh, look, I, I think at the end of the day, um, job growth has slowed down. 
Um, it was an improvement, yes, relative to what we saw last month, but that was a low hurdle. I mean, it was, it was, that was not a good report. Uh, I, I think the problem for me, though, with, with you know, everyone sort of you know, trying to say, hey, it was a good report, a bad report, the problem is this. This is the most lagging of economic indicators that we get. Um, and if this report did scream go 50, mm -hmm. then the, the real risk is that a recession would be upon us. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, use this report with a, a, a ton of caution yeah. uh, because it, it lags in the most profound way. So, yes, you're going to get a 25, and I think the Fed would be very pleased if they can continue to go 25 uh, over the next several meetings. Uh, and that is pretty much our call at this point. All right. I really like that distinction there that you uh, made about how this data point should be viewed with a great deal of caution. One thing about the jobs picture is that layoffs have been largely subdued. They remain yeah. subdued. And so that's prevented a recession. Yeah. How long can that stay the case? Because if the Fed starts cutting aggressively, can we move straight from tepid growth to normal job growth while avoiding job contractions? Yeah, Scarlett, I, again, I, I, I think it's a really smart question. I, I think what we have to do is we have to break down the labor backdrop into two distinct categories. One is the firing side of the equation, the other is the hiring side of the equation. And what we know is that there's obviously not a lot of firing that's taking place right now. But what we also know is that there, the hiring side of the equation is slowing down. It's been slowing down for, for quite a number of months. So I think that is why it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, this debate on 50 or 25, um, as it relates to this this conversation, I, I would argue that the Fed is being given a gift, right? The backdrop mm -hmm. hasn't slowed down that much yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the context of policy, that's actually pretty restrictive. Uh, I think it, it, it would, to me, would, um, would, would, would really argue for going 50, getting to neutral faster um, than sort of, you know, letting this sort of spread out o over the course of uh, the next year or so. You know, markets are lurching from data point to data point. So I wonder to what extent um, the next couple of data points, which is CPI and PPI next week, um, yep. how expectations are set up for those reports, given what we saw today, a lagging indicator? Yeah, I, you know, and, and, and <laughs> the, the sad reality is CPI is sort of a lagging indicator, too. But, mm. but we, can, we can go through that another day. Look, I, I, I think right now, as we look ahead, I think the path is pretty clear for the Fed just to continue to go 25 clips. Um, over you know the September meeting, then we have the November meeting, and then the December meeting. I mean, even taking that uh, into into the coming year. I mean, when I think about monetary policy, monetary policy is calibrated for a meaningfully higher inflation rate. Um, that no longer is the case, right? Yeah. Core inflation is now between two and a half and three uh, percent. I think that that to me is uh, really, I think, in, uh, really drives home this idea that you do not need policy calibrated at 550 any longer. I think it's time to get back down to neutral. This is clearly what the Fed has been arguing straight through. And, and I'll, I'll tell you one last thing, Scarlett, because I think this is the word of caution. Mm -hmm. Everyone's trying to sort of, you know, make a case for why the rise in the unemployment rate really hasn't been that, um, uh, you know, why it's been more benign than, than it might otherwise seem. But the problem is people don't know. All they know is that the unemployment rate is up. And if you look at the relationship between the unemployment rate and consumption, there, what, once the unemployment rate rises, consumption tends to slow. And I think that would be a really, to me, a very sound argument for the Fed just to continue to cut rates um, well into next year. Fantastic insight. Tom, always appreciate your joining us. Tom Porcelli is Chief U.S. Economist at PGM Fixed Income. All right. Well, today's report on jobs definitely puts a spotlight on some sectors that perhaps have been seeing or hiring fewer workers uh, than others since the pandemic. For more on what's happening within hospitality, I want to bring in Eugene Rem. He is co-founder and partner at Catch Hospitality Group. Eugene, thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you for having us. So clearly, as we were just talking with Tom, there's a clear trend of softness in the labor market. Companies are not hiring as much, but they're also not necessarily firing a lot of people either and letting people go. What are you seeing in your businesses uh, specifically and then in the industry at large? Absolutely. So the job report that just came out said that there were 40,000 new jobs. And I think that sounds good, but it's not because you're actually about seven and a half percent down to pre-pandemic rates. So even though there are jobs that are had, it doesn't mean that you're actually getting a big improvement from where you were pre-pandemic. And the bigger challenge is that 60 percent of all restaurants are understaffed today. So the jobs that I think are being taken are people who didn't want jobs in the beginning. So I think now those folks are taking the jobs that they couldn't take before because they need to make a living. So I think you're not really seeing a true picture of what's happening. Mm -hmm. For our business, I think what we've learned, and we learned it six months ago, 12 months ago, here's the reality of it. In urban markets, 
people are not working five days a week in an office, yeah. and that's just a big problem. And what's going to happen with that is you're going to have lower revenue. When you have lower revenue, you have to look at what you need to do. So you need to watch your labor costs, you need to watch your food costs, and you need to make every decision that you can that doesn't affect the guest experience mm -hmm. to, to lower your costs. And rent isn't going any lower, and all other labors are up, so there's really not much you can do there. Yeah, you have to be hyper-focused on your costs and be ruthless about where you spend your money. You mentioned that um, people in hospitality have to do more with less people. So those jobs that we've lost, that you've lost, those are gone permanently. They're not coming back, are they? Yeah, they're not coming back. We've learned how to operate better, and that is something, that is a gift of the pandemic and continues today, mm -hmm. and we don't see it coming back any other way. So I think in, specifically in urban markets or blue state markets where you have legislation that's just really making a challenge to operate, $20 minimum wages in California we just have to learn how to do more with less and that is a big statement that we use throughout the the organization making do uh, doing more with less um, I'm curious about what that looks like in this new landscape because you mentioned how cities and urban centers aren't getting as many people in during the week and the way people dine out is also different you have a lot more people looking to eat on their own in restaurants solo dining and that also affects what it looks like in terms of your turnover, how quickly you can turn over those tables. Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for your restaurants? I think the biggest issue is density. We don't have enough people that are going out in the early and the late and the mid. So right now you're having your, your prime time dining, which is 7 to 8.39. That's fine. And I think everyone's doing a great job there. Okay. But it's that 5.30 diner and that 10 p.m. diner. And COVID has changed the culture of dining out. So that's pivoted. So any large restaurant, you have less density. You're going to have less revenue. You're going to have to do the same amount of work with less people and that's just a simple way to do it. How do you innovate around that to encourage more people to come in earlier or to come in later? Is that something that you can directly affect? I, I think there are certain there are certain KPIs and things that you can do to make that happen and I think for us we just have to focus on the longevity of the brand keeping a great product but I don't think it's about like oh it's a happy hour so people are going to come people are going to do what they want to do and I think right. you just have to meet the guests where they are and it's not about a marketing strategy that's going to change that. Just very quickly, wh how, what does this mean for your expansion plans, if at all? Well, for our expansion plans, we're opening, we're helping the economy. So we're opening a new restaurant on Monday called The Corner Store in Soho. We're opening in Dallas in November, and we're opening in Scottsdale in February. So we're doing our part to grow, and we're thinking about, we know that I think quality products are always going to be available, and people are going to always want them, and I think that's just never going to change. Yeah, but you got to be a lot more strategic about your hiring in the process. Absolutely. Eugene, always appreciate your joining us. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Eugene Rem is co-founder and partner at Catch Hospitality. Now, coming up on Bloomberg Markets, Apple set to debut new generation products on Monday. We'll speak with our internal analysts about what it would take for the launch to land well with investors. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Markets, I'm Scarlett Fu. It's time now for the stock of the hour, which is Apple. The company reportedly greenlit a version of Tencent's WeChat app as it gears up for Monday's product launch event, where it is set to unveil details of the new iPhone 16. Anurag Rana, senior technology analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us now with more. So Anurag, this is the widely anticipated AI-enabled iPhone 16 that could launch a massive refresh cycle after, I believe, three years of pretty flat sales, uh, unit sales at least. It, but you caution that that's not going to happen right away, is it? Yeah, you know, we've done some work on this thing and Mark Gurman's done a phenomenal job of, you know, talking about when these features are going to come out. First and foremost, the AI features will take some time to roll out. It's going to take, you know, at least a year in terms of some of them will be, you know, near term. They'll be done in the U.S. first. Then we have to figure out how it goes globally. So it's not going to be that things are going to be available on October 1st for all the AI features. So that's going to be a staggered launch. Second, the form factor is not going to be that different than what it is in the last year's model. So you're not seeing a big surprise there. And according to Mark, iPhone 17, which is the next year model, is a big upgrade. So if you take a look at that, plus the Apple intelligence, we think the concept is the same, but it just gets pushed out by 12 months. Oh, interesting. Okay. And I, I fixate on the timeline here, Anurag, because now is when investors are assessing and anticipating which hardware suppliers will likely get a boost. Given what you just said about this staggered refresh cycle, what names would you pay attention to? See, within the, I would still go back to Apple and say, 
for the last three and a half, four years, they haven't seen a big jump in unit shipments, as you suggested. So we will see some shipment jump, but that's from the natural progressions of phones getting older and people going back and refreshing this. So mm. for, in our view, we should see at least a 5% jump there. And 5% jump with a skew towards the pro model could take revenue 7 8%, which is, to be honest with you, a very big deal because it hasn't happened in a long while. Yeah, it hasn't happened in a long while. So um, talk about specific companies that you would pay attention to in the supply chain among customers, among carriers. What's, what jumps out at you? See, our, our uh, carriers analyst, uh, John Butler, thinks AT&T is very well positioned in this particular area. Um, there are uh, display companies in Asia that also uh, benefit from this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know the, the number one thing in our view is what it does to Apple services business, because that's an area where, you know, we, you're going to see a higher, um, you could say, iCloud usage, higher Apple care. So, you know, this is this does, it's probably the most important event for Apple in a year. So, you know, we, we, we think there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm and not to forget new AirPods and new iWatches. So I think this is a this is an area where we think that could also get a bump. All right. Fantastic insight there. And it's a good reminder, too, of that services uh, part of the business, which is much higher margin and more predictable as well. Anurag, thank you, as always. Anurag Rana with Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up, the crypto industry bracing for potentially a new administration in Washington. We're talking next with the CEO of Tether to get his perspective. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Scarlett Fu. Crypto playing an increasingly big role in the upcoming election. The digital money crowd raising money to support candidates friendly, friendly to their industry, resulting in a series of pro-crypto policy proposals from the likes of former President Trump and one-time candidate RFK Jr. Let's get insight now from someone in the center of the digital money industry, and that is Paolo Ardoino. He is the CEO of Tether Holdings. Paolo, thank you for joining us. I know you're based in Europe, um, but Tether knows no boundaries. So I'm curious how you're thinking about the U.S. election in November. How big a deal do you think it is for the crypto industry? I think for, um, first of all, thank you for having me. I think um, the election will be very, very important for the crypto industry. We have seen both the candidates um, looking at uh, the current state of, uh, of um, cryptocurrency support in the U.S., um, I must say that um, the cryptocurrency industry in the U.S. has not been very well supported until uh, until currently. Um, we have seen um, actions against very important companies, um, and you know, being European, being Italian, I always seen the U.S. as being the predominant uh, country when it comes to all innovation. Right? I grew up in my youth, seeing uh, the U.S. being you know, the, the, the country bringing forward all the technological innovation, yeah. you know, on the movies, you would see, you would see that very clearly. And it feels weird that the U.S. is not taking the very same opportunity in leading right. uh, one of the most revolutionizing technologies in the world. No, that's a good point. And we know that both candidates have talked up their intent to support the crypto industry, um, one certainly more hyperbolically than the other. From where you sit as the company behind the Tether stablecoin, What's the bigger priority, reducing government regulation on the industry like what Trump is proposing or implementing safeguards or rules of the road like Kamala Harris is proposing? I think a mix of both is very important, right? You want to have uh, regulations, good regulations that are supporting this powerful technology. I mean, as the inventor, um, the company that invented the stablecoin um, market and, and technology, we think that is uh, is very important for both sides really understand how powerful it is and how sure. important it could be for um, for U.S. and U.S. economy, right? For right. example, Tether has, is, is crossing these days $100 billion in U.S. treasuries uh, in our reserves. Yeah. And basically what we were able to achieve through our technology is actually decentralized this is utilizing the access to mm -hmm. the uh, U.S. debt and the ownership of the U.S. debt. Yep. Um, while we are seeing countries like China and others are selling U.S. debt, right. we are proving that with um, our, you know, after 10 years, we were able to build a 350 million user base yep. of uh, new holders of the U.S. debt, right? So yep. this is so, such powerful and, of course, requires um, proper regulations and to, to ensure safety of the product. 
Paulo, I got to ask you about this new synthetic dollar backed by gold on your alloy by tether platform that you introduced in June. Um, I'm curious, what prompted this and who is this currency aimed at? So, um, first of all, it's very, very important for us to um, research new ways of, uh, of providing confidence to, um, to our user base and prove also the technology uh, yeah. based on, on blockchain. So, um, uh, until you know, 1971, the uh, uh, US dollar was backed by gold. And um, we uh, often hear about um, uh, the interest of, uh, of having from our customers to have an optionality, right? So it's not a replacement. We, we think that um, you know, USDT is the most used digital dollar across the world. Let's think about Argentina, Turkey, and many other countries. Right, right. And um, but we see also the opportunity to provide uh, an optionality for others that want to see a more transparent uh, backing of right. uh, of uh, a, 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 of a synthetic dollar. And uh, gold is probably the best asset to make that happen because it's much less volatile than Bitcoin. We could have, we could have done sure. with Bitcoin, but gold is uh, is probably a better choice for the short term. Paolo, I really appreciate your joining us today. Paolo Ardoino is the Chief Executive Officer of Tether Holdings, joining us from Lugano, Switzerland. I'm Scarlett Fu. That does it for Bloomberg Markets this hour. Keep it right here with the U.S. equity market in decline, led by technology, yields moving down, as well as investors anticipate Fed rate cuts later this month. This is Bloomberg.